Good evening. Welcome to the Red Hook Town Board meeting of October 9th, 2018. Would you be kind enough to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Um, Amanda, for the folks at home, we have a brief agenda for this evening, but if you'd be kind enough to display that for them. start out with the supervisor's report and the town clerk's report. For the folks at home, Amanda, if you'd be kind enough to scroll on over there. We started the month, and this is the month of September, ending September 30th with an opening balance of $5,603,154, receipts of $183,000 and change, disbursements of $402,000, leaving an ending balance of $5,384,423. And you will note Harry, for your benefit, CPF monies of 23000 coming in. Now with a total of $1,109,000 in that fund. We also received our full rental payment from the Red Hook School District of $7,500. Now that they're back to using and using quite often our tennis courts. Brand new We received our AIM money. Are there any questions about the supervisor's report? If not, would somebody like to make a motion to accept it? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'll direct your attention to some budget adjustments prepared by Ann Conway. Small amounts. Questions about the budget adjustments? Okay, if not, a motion to accept. So moved. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. You also have in your packet the variance report for the month. If you have any questions about that, please let us know. All right, very good. At this time, we have the town clerk's report. Sue? This is for the month of September. Total local shares remitted to supervisor as town revenue, $1,522.78. Amount paid to New York State Ag and Markets for the spayed and neutered program, $57. Amount remitted to New York State Department of Health for marriage licenses, $180. Amount remitted to New York State Environmental Conservation, $4,000. $14.72 for a total state, county, and local revenue of 
$574.50. This is pursuant to Section 27, Sub 1 of the Town Law, and I hereby certify that the foregoing is a full and true statement of all fees and monies received by me, Sue McCann, Town Clerk, during the period stated above in connection with my office. That's it. Very good. Thank you very much, Sue. Is there a motion to accept the Town Clerk's report? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Um, moving on to announcements, just a few quick announcements. Um, Dutchess County, a reminder again, they are having a hazardous waste disposal for non-residential. So that's schools, government agencies, farms, and businesses. That's going to be Friday, October 26th. That is for uh, generators um, that uh, accrue more, less than 220 pounds or approximately 26 gallons of non-acute hazardous waste uh, each month or generate no more than 2.2 pounds of acute hazardous waste per month. And you must register for the event um, by mailing into Dutchess County Solid Waste Management. Um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission um, is accepting a public comment on the uh, small hydroelectric um, project, uh, the 12 kilowatt project that is being prepared for the Annandale Dam. And you can go on the um, FERC library and visit the uh, project website, currenthydro.com. Annandale to get more information about that. And the invitation um, is for the meeting is October 30th, uh, 2018 at 615 at the Bertelsmann Campus Center in the MPR, uh, in the multi-purpose room. That's 30 North Ravine Road, Red Hook, New York. That's on Bar Campus. And a site visit is actually going to occur an hour before that at 5 o'clock. 1259 River Road is the location of the dam. Um, there is a uh, correspondence from uh, Congressman John Fazzo uh, talking about the Dutchess County Veterans Fair event that he is hosting Saturday, October 20th, 2018. It's going to be held from 10.30 to 12.30 p.m. at the Pleasant Valley Town Hall. And the only other announcement I would like to make is that at the annual historic Red Hook uh, meeting, it was very exciting uh, plans um, for historic Red Hook, the Elmendorf Inn. They are expanding to the, the adjoining property um, that would be eastward and creating a green space in the middle where their current parking lot exists, um, a very exciting project. And also at that meeting, there was a very lovely video, which I believe is on the uh, Historic Red Book website uh, as we speak. And the video talks about a, a young man, Bill O'Neill, growing up in the town of Red Hook. And it was done by our acclaimed documentary filmmaker, Seth Kramer, who lives right here in Red Hook Village. So I encourage you to uh, go to the, their website and find out all that they're doing and take a look at Bill O'Neill, age how old? That photo? The baby photo? Oh, the baby photo? Yeah. About six. Oh, I think I was less than, no, I was probably three. A young man. Yeah. In a wheelbarrow, I was like three. Three years old in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's all I have for announcements. Does anybody else have any announcements? Oh, and a reminder um, before I forget. We encourage you, please visit um, our website, www.redhook.org, our new website. If you've been watching these meetings, you know that we have a new website, courtesy of Sarah M. Bowden and our communications committee, and lots of other uh, dedicated employees here who have been working on it. And um, we encourage you to go to it, in particular, um, to sign up for the Notify Me function. That way you can find out what's uh, happening on the town board agendas, planning board agendas. You can find out that your road has been closed because of down wires and when it might uh, uh, be open again. So that's www.redhook.org. 
Okay. We did that. Yeah. All right. Very good. Uh, any public comments before we get started with our agenda? Linda Keeling. Since you mentioned the website, <laughs> it's not very good. It still looks terrible. Um, also, I had signed up for the notifications, and at one time I was getting the notifications. Now I'm not. Mm. And I didn't even get the notification about uh, the agenda for tonight. Okay. So it needs a lot of work. Um, I mean, even all well, before with Dick, the information would get up there relatively fast. And it seems that it's not happening very quickly with this new system. And I think paying what I was told, $24,000 for this, you're not getting what you're supposed to be getting for it. So you need to get on their case about it and get this site up and running properly to inform the people. That's what it's about. Uh, before, I, like I said, Dick would have the information up there almost immediately. I'd have a question for the uh, town clerk. She would contact Dick. The information would get up that day or the next day. It was that rapid. I don't think you have that with this website now. Okay. Well, thank you for your patience, Linda. And uh, I think as we've said before, we're, it's all new to us. We're working through the kinks, but it has a lot more functionality on this arrangement. But obviously, we're, we're all learning how to do it. Were you able to find the agenda for today? You just didn't get the notification. I was looking and looking all this morning up until 12 o'clock, and then I got busy with my life. And about, I guess, 5 or 6 o'clock, I found the agenda. Okay. But I did not get a notification. I thought it was up there on Friday. Yeah, it should have been up on Friday. I thought it was on Friday. We'll, we'll check into that. Okay. Yes, thanks for Something's not right. Thank you, Linda. Okay. Um, we have another public comment. Mr. Strawinski, please. I'd like please. to remind everybody about the Rotary Annual. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. And I mentioned historic bread and forgot to mention about their dinner. So would you be kind enough to, to let folks know? Thank you, Doug. Doug Strawinski. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the annual um, citizen of the year is on the 23rd, which is two weeks from tonight, at the firehouse. Tickets are available with any rotor. Any Rotarian for the village hall and the town hall. And uh, the citizens of the year are Chris and Claudine Close. Thank you. You're welcome. And it's at the firehouse. Did you say that? At the firehouse. Okay. Thank you, Doug. You saved me there. Okay, uh, the first item on the agenda is just very quickly for the public is to let you know um, that the uh, supervisor's tentative budget has been submitted for consideration to the town board. And there are just a couple of quick highlights. If you've seen this in previous years, you can just about go to sleep because it's not that different. But um, just to give you uh, a couple of points. Um, the tentative budget, as proposed, does not raise um, the tax rate for the third year in a row. Um, it's, uh, the impact is unchanged, yet it keeps the fund balances steady and strong. Um, our credit rating, which was raised a couple of years ago, uh, still remains AA, that is uh, second to perfection. Um, our risk assessment is nearly perfect. We just received last week, the Comptroller's Office um, gave us our rating for the Fiscal Stress Report for year ending 2017. I think I mentioned this at the last meeting. It's 1.7% versus beginning stress, which is 45, and significant moderate to significant, which is 65. So the budget, um, which is flat, takes into account some investments we've made over the last few years are going to make Route 9, the sidewalks, Town Hall parking lot, um, in particular this last year, um, improvements to existing recreational parks, whether it's rehabbing fields or brand new tennis courts, 
um, structures, we've done some repairs, um, and um, the budget includes uh, things that we are working on towards next year. That's a new playground, expansion of the park itself, and we have projects which we've started that are related to the town campus, clean energy and energy efficient upgrades, um, and also increasing accessibility here in town hall. So, um, the budget takes into account all of those things. We can't do it by ourselves, the town supervisor, the town board. We do it with a lot of partnerships. We do it with great employees and a lot of dedicated volunteers. And we do it with grant monies. And so I continue to add to the list of the grant dollars that we've received over the last three years or so, just to give you some idea of how we're able to accomplish this with not only expense management but also partnerships. Some of the things we've done over the last few years I've mentioned before in order to keep expenses down so we can make these investments. And that's it. So I encourage everyone to go to uh, the website Redhook.org, the entire budget is on there, as well as a budget uh, message letter, and you can take a look for yourself. And we will be holding, um, this would be a good time to mention we're going to have budget meetings, and we discussed three potential dates, 11, 17, and 22, but it sounds like, Christine, if I understand yeah, this correctly, I can't be here on the 11th, you can't. Trip on the 11th, okay. Um, well, so then can we consider the 17th and the 22nd? We would start on the 17th and uh, 7 p.m. I think you had mentioned you could make 7 p.m., is that right? Yep. Okay, and the 22nd? 7 no, this is October? Yes, I'm sorry, Harry, yeah, okay. October. 10, 17? 10, 22. 10, 22. Uh, the 22nd would be a Monday? What was the other one? 17th. 17th would be a, I'm sorry. 17th would be a Wednesday. Do I have that right? Yeah, 17th is a Wednesday and the okay. 22nd is a Monday. It's good with me. What time on Monday? 7 and 7. 17th and 22nd. We'll set them both up. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, We'll put that notice on the website for folks at home if you'd like to join us for the budget meeting. Okay. Uh, very good. So 2019 CDBG grant application. So we had discussed, it's a good um, segue. We had discussed um, going out for additional grant monies, CDBG grant monies, to do more accessibility improvements to the current rec park. We talked about finishing off the bathrooms, whatever we needed additional monies for that because we got a $50,000 grant for that. Pathways, um, uh, entrances, because you know that entrance there is very difficult for people to come in from the north parking lot there. And the fencing is in need of some attention, is that a fair fair assessment? That's correct. Um, so we need to figure out a better way for folks to be able to get into the park. And so that uh, is something we look at. And we have folks from the county who are going to come to the park actually tomorrow, as it turns out. And they're going to walk through some of these specifics to include in this grant application. It's $100,000 that we'd be eligible for. We're being encouraged to apply for this. Um, which is a good sign. It's past the initial, you know, they do a initial um, review. review to see if it meets the criteria. And so we talked about pathways and accessibility to the uh, new playground to ensure that everyone can, can get there. Um, so the folks at the county also may have other ideas of other obstacles that exist in our current work park that we could add on to it. Obviously, we'll look, we're only going to get $100,000. So does that seem 
like a good plan. Any other thoughts about that for Red Park? Harry, any no, other that makes, that makes sense. What, what about designing it? Is who's going to design it? Right. So I think yeah. we would probably make sense to, to ask uh, Brandy if if, yeah. if you would to do that application for us. You have all the specifics already. You did the application for the grant that got us the fifty thousand um, dollars, and you're doing the walkthrough also yes. tomorrow. Okay. Very good. And Harry, I think you probably want to join us for Wait, that. What time? Uh, two o'clock. Two. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and Doug and John will be there as well. And I'll actually be able to be there as you well. You can. Yep, okay, great. Can okay, see. terrific. Mm -hmm. So that works well. All right. Um, so any other thoughts? If not, I would um, entertain a motion for this resolution that we have, which is... 67. 67. Thank you, Sue. How did you know what I was going to ask? So moved. <coughs> All right. Good second. Uh, October 9th. <laughs> And basically, uh, the resolution is that we are participating in the County Community Development Consortium for fiscal year 2019. And the grant application, the amount of $100,000 for ADA accessibility improvements at the Red Hook Recreational Park. And it is so moved by Bill O'Neill and is seconded by Harry. Mary, is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, our third item on the agenda, and we have a small agenda this evening, is um, we have um, some findings on our assessment. We asked our engineering firm to do a needs assessment as it relates to athletic fields and athletic field usage. And so. Randy Nelson is with us tonight to give us hot off the big screen instead of hot off the presses. Trying to save paper. Trying to save paper, okay, good. Did you email it to everybody? I did not email it to everybody, but I certainly can, or it's in Robert's inbox, you can it's in, Yeah, okay. it's in the town one and I can circulate. It just came like an hour and a half ago, right? Yes, you could get on Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. So for the record, I'm Brandy Nelson with Tie and Bond Engineering. And um, as you all are aware, we are conducting um, a um, athletic fields uh, needs assessment for the Town of Red Hook um, Recreation Commission. Um, the needs assessment is really geared to providing you with fact-based information to make decisions about how to plan recreational facility development in the future. And so um, tonight I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes to just go over the methodology that we used and some of the preliminary observations. Um, our focus was on reviewing the existing conditions of athletic fields in the town. Um, we focused on those fields that are owned by the municipality uh, but that said, there are obviously um, fields that are in use in the municipality, including Father Carroll Field, which the church's field, um, the school's fields, and the Red Hook Soccer Club fields. Um, we looked specifically at town-owned fields for utilization, how those fields are being utilized um, by the various programming, then we looked at um, nationally accepted data for benchmarking, um, what type of facilities uh, are common in similar sized communities, um, and we'll get into that. Um, our process also include public outreach, and then we'll summarize everything into a report. So tonight I'm focusing on just the existing conditions, the utilization, and the benchmarking that was done. Oh dear, what happened there? What happened there? I don't know, because my printed copy has a schematic on it that's not there. Um, I will have to send this file again to all of you. I apologize for this. I'm not sure uh, what happened, because I opened this file and I printed a copy for myself. So um, basically, 
Um, our inventory of municipal fields looked at athletic fields within the town of Red Hook. Those are broken out into two categories, publicly owned fields and privately owned fields. Under privately owned fields, we've got the fields that um, are operated by the Red Hook Soccer Club, and we've got the Father Carroll field. Under publicly owned fields, we have two categories. One are school district owned fields, and the other are municipally owned fields. Under school district owned fields, there are fields at the high school campus, the middle school, and the elementary school. Um, at the high school, there are seven rectangular fields. Uh, at the middle school, there's what we're calling an overflow field. It's not a formal field, but informal play has occurred there uh, for some time. And if you were to visit those sites, you see some limited uh, equipment and, and development that suggests there's some degree of play there. Same thing with the elementary school. There's a similar overflow field. As far as the municipally owned fields, we looked at Village of Tivoli and also the town of Red Hook. Village of Tivoli has a single field, uh, the Stephen Kuhn Memorial Field, and the town of Red Hook has um, the north, middle, and south fields that are located in Rec Park East, um, as well as an overflow field in Rec Park East. That's the formal, informal play area located inside the walking track. Hopefully there'll be a graphic on the next one. There is. I don't know why this didn't come out, because it, it shows up on another device. Another one, but yeah. So, um, just graphically for everybody's um, information, uh, this is Rec Park East. Um, to the left side of the screen is the North Softball Field. That's predominantly where women's uh, softball is played. Um, the Middle Softball Field is predominantly where men's softball is played. Uh, that field is the only field in the town that has lights on it, and that will come into play when we discuss field utilization. Then there is the south baseball field, uh, and the overflow field you can see is not really, there's not much going on there, but it is a, a grassy space that's available. Um, these fields are used extensively for uh, diamond sports. So diamond sports are um, your baseballs and your softballs, um, both by people in the community um, and also with the school district. Um, then at Stephen Kuhn Memorial Field in the village of Tivoli, they have a single field that is um, used actually very infrequently. Um, it has unusual dimensions and is somewhat constrained by the residential development about, uh, around it, but in talking with the village and Harry probably knows. Um, the field tends to be very wet. Um, the soil conditions there are clay, and it's a difficult field to um, get water to drain off of, and because of its wet condition, it doesn't have any regular scheduled play on it. Then um, proceeding to school district fields, these are the fields at the high school and middle school complex. Um, you can see there are uh, seven rectangular fields that we've identified. Um, interestingly, in talking with the school district, they said fields number one, which is in the lower left corner, and field number four, which is up at the top of the page, uh, both have drainage conditions and are played on a very limited basis uh, because of the wetness of those fields. The other fields don't seem to have the same issues with wetness and receive more extensive play by the school district. Um, field number six, I thought, was a field that they were using for baseball. Um, and it turns out they told us they removed the baseball field um, more than 15 years ago, um, but they've never been able to get grass to grow in that area. So it continues to, from an area, look like a baseball field, but they only play rectangular sports there. So rectangular sports are soccer, field hockey, lacrosse, and football. Um, and then field seven is the field they use predominantly for, um, for football and soccer. Uh, and then in the lower right corner is the middle school, and we're calling that the overflow field. Again, that's where there's some limited play that occurs. Um, and I believe there's a, a metal backstop there and you can see a little bit of a wear pattern above the word middle that um, shows that there's some bases that have uh, been used over the years for some diamond sport play. Uh, and then at the elementary school, 
the elementary school has a, an additional overflow field where limited diamond sports um, are played. And moving on to private fields, there's the Red Hook Soccer Club fields, which are on uh, leased land on Rockefeller Lane. The fields that are striped there are predominantly youth soccer fields of varying sizes uh, and uh, one adult soccer field. Um, again, that's a, a private field. And then lastly in the town is Father Carroll Field. Uh, everyone's probably familiar with it due to its location on 199. Um, but this is the field predominantly where Little League Baseball is played. Um, this field is very constrained as far as um, any ability to expand. It technically doesn't meet the um, dimensions for Little League play, um, but nevertheless it is principally where Little League is played. Um, so after identifying all the various fields, um, what we did was we conducted an evaluation of the condition of the fields. Um, I just wanted to walk you through a typical form so that you understand the things that we're looking at for these fields. Um, so we um, conducted for the municipally owned fields, we actually conducted an on the ground um, inspection and made observations of the field conditions. For the privately owned fields, we did what's called a desktop analysis where we made observations from aerial photography. Um, so for the conditions assessment, we looked at, um, you know, contact with somebody related to the field. We conducted an interview about how the field is being used. Um, and then we made a geometric evaluation. So um, the various sports builders associations and, um, and <clears throat> sporting associations have standard dimensions for play of various sports. And what we wanted to do was take a look at how do each of the fields measure up to what is the standard for preferred play or formal play. It doesn't mean that a field can't be used in a particular way, it just means it, whether or not it's meeting the technical standards for play. Um, we also looked at the solar orientation of the field, so is it a preferable orientation, not preferable. Sometimes fields are oriented so that you're actually looking into the sun and it's not ideal for play. We looked at the systems related to the field, so things like irrigation, drainage, lighting, and fencing, all of which are important components for the playability of the field. And then we looked at auxiliary equipment. Um, so those are things that uh, aren't necessary for the level of municipal sports, but as you get into more formal league type sports become more important. So that's things like bases, goalposts, um, uh, scoreboards, dugouts, um, benches, uh, and uh, audio video type systems that uh, help in calling the games. We looked at field striping, we looked at the parking facilities and the proximity of parking facilities to the fields. We looked at ADA accessibility. Um, we looked at issues related to site safety. Uh, we looked at other ancillary buildings, so like if there are restroom facilities or if there are um, uh, snack facilities nearby. Um, we have in our standard form for doing these assessments a soil sample. We did not take any soil samples in this case. In some instances when we're looking at uh, athletic fields in other communities, they may be wanting to undertake a program where they would really be boosting their turf on their fields and so they'd want a soil sample collected so that they could do an analysis of what nutrients needed to be added maybe in the off season to really get the turf reestablished. Um, but we did not do that in this case. And we took a look at how, this, um, how the fields pitch, so what their slopes and grades are, if it's even, if it's uneven. Where you have uneven slopes, you can tend to get ponding water if you don't have good drainage, as is the case with the Stephen Coon field. Um, and then we looked at the turf condition. Um, that all of the town's uh, fields are turf grass. And so we have a, a category one through five of unsuitable, so it's you know, no turf basically, um, to excellent. Um, turf condition is important because it speaks to the underlying condition of the soil and soil compaction and also the playability of the field. Um, good 
conditioned turf tends to be a safer playing surface than poor conditioned turf, so it factors into the safety of the field. Um, and then we made general observations about um, the appearance, and then we summarize it in a matrix. So what we're doing with this information is we'll, we've compiled it for all the fields. We're putting it together in a matrix so that you'll have a, an overall snapshot of each field and what its conditions are and where there are opportunities to um, plan for improvements or maybe make some maintenance tweaks um, or make some you know, wholesale changes depending on what the town wants to do. And the summary of recommendations for each field will be provided in the report. So after assessing the, the physical condition of the field, we took a look at the utilization of the fields. And I want to just provide a little bit of information about um, utilization. Um, utilization is um, an assessment of the number of hours per week that the field is available for play versus the number of hours per week that the field is needed for play. And um, availability is not formally defined anywhere. So it can be defined for your community. Uh, but in general, availability is um, a realistic look at the hours that people will be, could be out on a field. So for instance, during weekdays, uh, typically most of us are either um, at work or at school between let's say eight and three. And so those hours would not contribute towards availability of a field because people are otherwise occupied. So availability during a, a, a month of the year where school is in session um, would be say 3 p.m. until dusk. And so um, we've described you know, how we've defined availability for these fields and then as far as hours needed, um, that information is gleaned from interviewing the people that are doing the programming for these fields. So we've talked with John Kuhn, um, we've talked with um, the athletic director of the high school, and um, we've talked with the folks with Little League Baseball about um, their needs as far as uh, the athletic fields are concerned. Um, the other thing about our climate, where we are typically um, field sports are not played in the summertime when it's hot and people aren't around and they're on vacation, and they're typically not played in the winter when we have snow on the ground. So generally, the principal field usage in the Northeast is in the fall and in the spring, and it um, often correlates to um, the school year and sports that are played throughout the school year. Um, so this table is a table that will end up in, in the report to you and it provides a summary of utilization. Um, in the left column we have identified the field locations and we've looked um, principally <clears throat> we've looked principally at the the um, municipally owned fields so th that would be I'm sorry the publicly owned fields so that would be the municipally owned fields and the school district fields. Um, we've provided the total hours per week for both the fall and the spring um, that these fields are needed based on information gathered from um, the folks that do the programming. And then we've provided the total available hours for each of those fields um, for fall and spring. Um, I want to point out, uh, as far as utilization is concerned, for the middle softball field at Red Park East, that field, you'll notice, has a longer availability than, um, than any of the other fields, and that is because it has lights, and so that gives an opportunity to play on the field longer. Um, it's not prominent on this um, drawing, or on this form, but you'll see for the north of softball field, so for that first row at the top there, in the spring, the total number of hours needed is 42.5, and the total number of hours available is 41. So we've got bold text where the number of hours needed um, is equal to or more than when the field is available. Uh, what this table is showing us is that, uh, in general, <clears throat> the, the rectangular fields at the school are being utilized pretty much as much as they can. 
Um, I want to point out fields one and four at the school have zero hours in the spring, and again, that is attributed to the wetness condition that I mentioned before. They actually rest those fields all through the spring because they just get too much damage if they play on them. Um, so this, the high school soccer fields or rectangular fields are fully utilized. Um, the, the diamond fields that the town owns have capacity in the fall, but are um, at capacity in the spring. And what this table does not allow for is any flexibility in play. So let's say we have um, a rain day and you just don't have any extra room, particularly in the spring, uh, to move games around. You end up having to cancel games. Um, it also shows that particularly in the spring, there's not any capacity for informal play on any of these fields. If you want to just toss a ball around um, or practice your pitching or um, you know, do some soccer drills. And it also doesn't allow for any rest periods. So from time to time, you do need to do maintenance on the turf. Um, you may need to uh, repair uh, baselines or pitching mounds. And so this is showing that really there's no extra capacity to take care of some of those regular maintenance things, to take a field out of service for any particular amount of time. Um, so, so that's the general snapshot on field utilization. And then <clears throat> benchmarking. So for benchmarking, the benchmarking is focused, um, we looked specifically at municipally owned fields. We did not include the school district fields here. So these are just municipally owned. And we did that because in talking with the school district, their fields are so heavily used. And if you recall the aerial photo we were looking at of the school, a lot of the soccer field or the rectangular fields at the school have bare spots on them. Um, and so they're very worn. Um, from the utilization table, you see that they're using those fields you know, 50 to 75 to up to 90% of the time that they're available. And the AD just had indicated they just don't have extra capacity. So they did not want to be included because they don't feel like they can commit to supporting community sports on a regular basis due to the heavy school use. Um, so we looked at the benchmarking. Benchmarking comes from um, the National Recreation and Park Association, which is an industry organization that's been around for a number of years. Um, NRPA was also referenced in the 1994 uh, recreation needs assessment that was done for the town of Red Hook. But what NRPA has done over the last 25 years is they've changed their approach to benchmarking just a little bit. They used to be very prescriptive. They used to say, your town has a population of X and therefore should have X number of sports facilities. They've changed that approach and what they've gone to is more of a, um, a data-driven approach where they have collected information on communities across the country um, of certain populations and they've looked at what, what number of facilities do these communities have. So what that allows you to do is um, develop um, this column on the right here, the mean number of residents per facility. So this is from actual data, it's not prescriptive, it's not saying you need to have two of this kind of field and three of that kind of field, it's saying based on the whole country, if you've got 6,628 people, you should have a youth baseball field. So what we do with this is we take um, the mean number of residents per facility and we divide it by Red Hook's population, which has been relatively stable at around 11,100 people for about the last 10 years, you know, plus or minus. And we divide that um, to get the number of facilities required for the Red Hook population per the benchmarking. And so in our first row, we've got fields, youth baseball, um, 1.7 fields. We, we rounded down um, to one, and we then show that you've got <coughs> one field provided by the town and one field provided by a private entity. Um, so in this case, the field provided by the town is Father, or excuse me, is um, Stephen Kuhn field. Um, so footnote four here says that this field is in disrepair. It physically meets the dimensions for the youth um, baseball, 
but because of its drainage problem, it isn't considered um, playable on a regular basis. Uh, and then provided by private entities is the Father Carroll Field. Um, and it is played by Little League right now, but as I had mentioned previously, dimensionally, it's considered short. It doesn't meet the technical um, size, but it's a field and it's where people are playing. And so generally we'd say there's not a deficit there. So we've done that for all the different size fields um, based on NRPA's um, benchmarking data to figure out you know, where does Red Hook fit in compared to similar size communities. And the result um, is shown in the red text on the far right column. And basically what it represents is that the town um, could use the following, there's three fields that it could use. I don't know, Robert, if you can scroll just a tiny bit more. Um, I know we lose that top bar there, there we go. So the three red texts are a rectangular, multi-purpose field, um, a diamond <coughs> field for T-ball, and a rectangular lacrosse field. So that's from the NRPA benchmarking data. Does anybody have any questions on that? That's where I'm going next. <laughs> What's the, what is the column to the left? The column. What do those numbers represent? It says population. Yep, yep. So based on NRPA's um, data collection of recreational facilities, uh, at communities around the country. So if they've looked at more than 60,000 different communities, they've said there are one, uh, for instance, one diamond field for softball, adult softball, per 10,957 people, or one that, rectangular... That, that is not our population today. No, 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 so that's their but, recommendation, that that number. It's the average population. So for every 10,900 people, you should have one. And then they took that field. You have one field for that, and for then that they population. And compared it to Red Hook's population. They divided it by okay. Red Hook's okay. And that's where you get the one okay. or the 1.7 okay. okay. or the 1.3. Okay. That's the recommendation for okay. a week. Okay. Does that make sense, Harry? Yes. Okay. The population numbers don't match our population. That's correct. But they're meant to be there to I benchmark understand. and then they divide Red Hook's population. That's how you know yeah. why yeah. you got a 1.0 or a 1.7. Okay. Right. Right, exactly. Um, my question would just be, you know, you mentioned the overflow spaces and various facilities, including town-owned spaces, and I know that that's often where we play t-ball. So I'm wondering, like, why is there, I realize this is just sort of like a policy question, I guess, by the town, but when it talks about diamond fields, t-ball, um, it seems to me like we have, we already provide that. It's not a formal field, but we already have a facility that covers that. So um, I'm not sure, to my mind, that it's accurate to show the, the red negative, you know? So physically, the dimensionally, yeah. like from a geometry standpoint, um, what we are trying to state in the report is that these are the preferred dimensions for play of this type of sport. So we're, we're going to provide all the different preferred dimensions. You don't have a field that meets those preferred dimensions, but we could do some shuffling, right? You could shuffle, um, you could meet the preferred dimensions at Father Carroll, for instance if that was something that the town wanted to do. So we want to give you that geometric information and you guys can then make the decisions around how you want to allocate the play space. But I mean, is there anywhere that shows where T-ball already happens? Because we have programs that already operate. Yep, t -ball. so our understanding is it is occurring in the informal play spaces, but as I had mentioned previously, they just dimensionally, they're very significantly smaller than what's recommended. Yeah, but we'll provide those dimensions of those overflow fields so you can see that. And it'll mention that T-ball already occurs there. It does mention that, yeah. Also, Brandy didn't, um, at one, and Doug, maybe you can help too, at the um, one of the um, open forums that we had, and the uh, gentleman who's currently the, the president, or whatever they call that, of the Little League group, um, was talking about that there are different programs that Little League could offer, um, or youth baseball, I guess is what you should call it, um, that we don't offer, we don't have in our area because there's not space for them. And I think one of them referred to t-ball type 
sports. So there's quite sort of like an introductory program, and then there was also there was also the older in between age. You're right to remember that, and um, I don't think we currently have any narrative that addresses that comment in the draft report that we're pulling together. But that's probably a valid thing to mention. Um, specifically, he did mention, you know, that a, an additional little league field would be. Um, preferable for them. I don't. I wasn't there, so I'm not sure how strongly he stated that. Um, but he also specifically mentioned that there is an age group that gets lost between um, little yeah. league and high school because there's just no field space to let those right. kids and then play. there's also a, a younger age group because um, we don't have an official, you know, t-ball dimensional opportunity. So we do end up with, you know, like when my kids did t-ball, we're in one little place of the park. You know, you're sort of you're hitting it wherever you can find a place to go. So um, maybe Ryan was at that meeting. He so, was, and I told him he didn't need to come tonight, but I will definitely so, ask him yeah. about that. I know yeah, he's I probably got it in his notes. In my notes from Matt, I, yeah. I took away that um, the more he um, thought about it, <laughs> you know, that there are certainly, they could be, youth baseball could be providing more opportunities for different age groups if we had space. Does that ring a bell with you, Doug? Well, that's correct. And, and Especially when you get to the 12 and above, right. that age group is the one where we're having the uh, trouble not providing for them. Right. And he gave us a specific size, 50 by 70, if I remember correctly, right? Right. That he and so we tweaked that field to make sure that it could accommodate that as as well. I just um, since you brought it up. Well, Ryan had prepared, and I think probably with your assistance as well, uh, a list of activities, sports, organized and, and not, that we are not able to accommodate, mm -hmm. as well as a list of activities that would be accommodated on um, the new multi-use field that's also ADA accessible. Um, and I, I think it would be good just as an appendix or something to, to add to this if you think that's wise, just so people can have that in context. And, and your slides are great. I would just say that you might want to think about, um, you know, as you finalize them, putting in some of your narrative. So when you talk about, well, there's no time to use these fields during the normal time that a child, for example, after school would want to go throw a ball with a friend because it's being used for the schools that have priority. You know, also those the repair issue was interesting. It was, I, I didn't realize we did not have the capacity to take Let something the rest, be, yeah. Oh, well, or, and yeah, or even repair something. Yeah, and I certainly don't want to be knocking what the rec committee is doing or the rec department is doing as far as maintenance it's just you know just looking at the straight numbers number of hours of use versus number of hours available you know I, I think John tries to get out there as much as he can in those un those quote unquote unavailable hours to get and some of his time. maintenance dealt with but mm -hmm. there's no time for I mean there is, so just to be clear though I mean there is a lot of available time for maintenance like if you're talking about just a specific finite Maintenance it job. depends on how you define maintenance. Right. So and things like turf restoration. Days, I realize I'm yeah. just saying, you know, Christina's saying the dead of night, but you know, if there's an issue oh, on the fields, like they, that, you know, the rec <coughs> department may like works during the day, right? You guys aren't. It's not That's like correct. But we also work on the weekends yeah. because right. there's games. Right. All those fields have to be striped, yeah. uh, as well as well as raked and groomed. Right. Uh, so that occurs prior to the games. And then usually after a game's done, it's got to be done again. Right. There are times when it's too wet for you to get on the field, right? Well, sure. Where you'll only do more damage than good, right? We do close the fields, yeah. depending on the weather. Yeah, and from, from what we understand, closing the fields, and, and I think I got this from John, when they close the fields, they just cancel games. They don't even try and reschedule because the seasons are limited in nature. Um, I think there's a little bit of flexibility towards the end, but if you get too far out into June, people are gone and then they lose kids off the team because they're away at camp or, you know, they've gone on vacation or what have you. So. Yeah. Well, I think it's just important to have some of that narrative, and I think one of, one of the most important points you brought up, which hasn't 
been spoken about a lot um, is the usage on the school district fields because when people come in and talk to me and say you know why do we need additional fields and I explain well the school fields are essentially used all the time or overused that the wear and tear and so they're not looking to accommodate any additional usage or the Red Hook Soccer Club is on rented land the public cannot use that um, it's subject to an easement with you know strict language um, it's important for folks to know that that there actually isn't really a rectangular field that the town controls the scheduling has access to there's just that little unused area there um, in Rec Park but really not a full-size rectangular field anywhere so well it's used for multiple purposes too I mean in the summertime it's volleyball right in the fall it's flag football right right uh, and t-ball right so yeah if you would consider it a narrative Absolutely. and then yeah. um, those two appendix appendices you know if you could do that sort of quickish and yep. then we can send it around so it gives sort of the context of your presentation tonight absolutely okay yeah. okay all right Good. did you guys look at all that um i know the little league is shared with ryan beck and I, maybe there's a baseball team where they're sending ryan beck kids over to our team like for the high school is that right do you know that that's what i heard in one of the discussions i know the little league yeah. To join forces with Ryan Beck. Yeah, I thought there because was a Because Ryan Beck's numbers were down. Right. Letters were, were pretty consistent, but yeah. Ryan Beck's numbers were down. Yeah. And I thought I heard um, that there's like a high school team or a middle school baseball team that also was combining. I don't know if you heard that. Well, what they're trying to do, what they'd like to do, is do a modified. Right. That's what I thought. Right. So my only question with that is just, um, you know, realizing that we don't want to add much more to your workload, but it just seems like we heard a lot about things that are already happening with Ryan Beck or, Ryan Beck or potential for sharing with Ryan Beck, and I'm wondering if, if you've done any desktop analysis of any of those fields that are municipally owned there that are for baseball and, you know, the, like the youth diamond yep. sports. So, um, to be fair, we are <clears throat> focusing on what is under the town of Red Hook's um, control and in the town of Red Hook. Um, but we're absolutely aware that there's some discussion about Rhinebeck and we did in fact go take a look at Rhinebeck's fields. Those are actually softball fields, they're not baseball fields. So there is some, I think, misinformation out there that those are baseball fields and, and they're not. Um, I wasn't planning on including that in the report um, only because I feel like it's a slippery slope to go down because then it's like what's going on in Milan and what's going on in Claremont and Livingston and we could just like have to look at the whole region so I thought you know we just for the interest of the project let's just draw the boundary around the town of Red Hook proper it's just something I, I mean I, I think it'd be helpful to maybe also add in the narrative would be just that um, if if sports are already combining with Ryan Beck that that may be a potential avenue for you know other other fields you know would be just just that who you know kind of like who knows the opportunity may be there or something because i think it's pretty well, I, clear I that they have that, but yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah i, I, I disagree I think too wrong, i think it muddies the waters i mean you really you've you've found a the nrpa way of looking at it um we're looking at what's under our purview and then to say you know what may or may not happen about a merger of a team with an adjoining community i think muddies the water for the purpose of what we need to decide so I would disagree with that along with Bill yeah I don't think shared services is reaching into the recreational communities in every municipality is it no our, 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 our fields are used well uh, by many many teams that are not out of Red Hook uh, um, you know and, uh, and particularly with seniors uh, aren't, aren't they He's talking uh, about over 40, 40, what do you, what yeah, you refer yeah, to them? Yeah. Over 40. Well, I'm referring to all of them. I think we have some um, raw data from our um, interviews that talks about who's using the fields, and we could certainly incorporate that in, and, and it would be very plain about, you know, everybody's got a team name, and, and so we've got all that data, we can include that, and I'm sure it includes 
the odd person from another community, but you know we don't have a detailed accounting of the number of people from other communities. I guess so we, one of the things we don't don't know is that we have we tend to have better fields than many of other communities, and and if we we were playing a high school, some another high school, do, do they do we have to go back to that high school? <laughs> How often? And does that high school only come here to play our team? I think there's a fair amount of that. Yeah, I mean that's a discussion for you guys yeah. to have. Well, yeah. It's a reality of life. Yeah. Yeah. So Brandy could I think we got like, just to just to say about the shared services though, that we are one of the only towns that share extensively with the school district and that's considered a shared service. So, you know, in some ways we are sort of forward thinking in that way, or I don't know if it's really forward thinking because we kind of fell into that relationship and you know, we've kind of built it as as we go along and I think it's something we should be proud of while also recognizing that it presents challenges for everybody too. Um, I just hate to see us like not at least, you know, just sort of realize that there is already some sharing going on with with programs that are already happening within the town um, that are using facilities outside of town. Um, I think it just to present a realistic picture of what's happening to not acknowledge that like Rhinebeck, Red Hook, Little League, I believe is playing games not just at Father Carroll Field. I could be wrong about that. That's just what I've heard. Um, you know, I think it's it's part of the picture, you know. Well, okay, so I mean, we haven't seen your raw data, but uh, I'm operating under the impression that like the Father Carroll Field is Red Hook Little League's home field, right? So, right. so when they play, I don't know, I don't know another local team that they play, but then they must have a home field that Red Hook then goes and plays at at some times, right? Absolutely. Yes. Milan or something, right? So it's kind of the same, same thing. Just like high school sports, if we're playing, right. if we're playing Pine Plains. They come play our on our fields here, and then we have an away game at Pine Plains or whoever, whatever league, right? That's so correct. correct. Okay. Because you want, you know, everybody wants to have a home field advantage at some point when they're playing their games. Did you talk to, you talk to like different private groups like the Little League and soccer as part of this or not? I forget how that went. Um, I have to think about, how, we've had so many conversations over such a long stretch of time. Um, I'm trying to think if we've talked to the Red Hook Soccer Club for this particular effort. I would have to double check on that, Sarah. I don't know off the top of my head. Brandy, my question for you is on this NRPA. Mm -hmm. um, how <clears throat> representative is the average community as compared to Red Hook? So if Red Hook, for instance, was a little bit more of a family-oriented community than say a retirement community of 11,100 people, the numbers would be quite different. That's a good, um, that's a really good question. Um, the only thing I can tell you right at this moment, and I can certainly look into that a little bit more, is that, um, that this is somewhat based on density, so number of people per square mile. Okay. And so I believe it's geared more towards suburban type communities, um, which is what we would classify this, as opposed to an urban community where you might have a significantly larger density per square mile, and that would skew your demand in a, you know, in a different fashion. So I can look into that and get back to you on <clears throat> what some of those um, demographic qualifiers are. Very good. Okay, so maybe a final report at our next meeting? Yes. Terrific. And in the meantime, if you could add, you know, those things and we can send it around so everybody yep. can have a copy of that Sounds to complete good. your, your draft report. We'll call it a draft. Yeah, well, I'll re-PDF this because I'm not sure what happened to that first graphic. And uh, It's very see. light. It's very light, that graphic. You may want to think about that. Yeah. That's maybe why it didn't come through. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, guys. No, no worries. No worries. Okay. Very good. Um, at this time, is there um, correspondence we're going to go through, and then we're going to close the meeting, go into attorney-client. I don't think I have any correspondence for this evening. Would anybody like to make some public comments? Linda, please. I have a question for Brandy. Um, Ward has a lot of land, and they just 
purchased Montgomery Place. I was wondering if you had talked to them in considering maybe using some portion of their lands for the Little League, it seems to be needing space. Yeah, no, we have not talked to Bard at all as a private institution. We haven't engaged them. We've really just looked at... Yeah, well, they, they try to get more into the community, so they might be open to it. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Well, if there's nothing for this, uh, this evening, um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. And at this time, I'd like to make a motion that we go into attorney-client. So moved. Is there a second? All, all in favor? Aye.